Well, welcome back. This last session in this series on pulmonary pathophysiology is going to be devoted to respiratory failure. Now, you'll remember that at the beginning of the series, in fact, at the beginning of the respiratory physiology series, we made the point that the primary function of the lung is gas exchange. And so it's not surprising that respiratory failure is uh, looked at in terms of the ability of the lung to maintain the arterial PO2 and the PCO2 in the normal range. However, there is no absolute figures, there are no absolute figures for the levels of PO2 and PCO2, which we define as respiratory failure. Uh, for example, let me uh, give you two uh, cases. Suppose we have a man of 60 years old with uh, a long history of COPD, uh, very severely limited exercise tolerance, arterial PO2, say about 50, normal PCO2, or perhaps even slightly elevated, that man can usually potter around the house and leave a, lead a reasonably comfortable life in spite of the fact, of course, that his lung is severely damaged. Uh, the PO2 is very low. But traditionally, we don't regard that person as in respiratory failure. Let's take another example. Suppose you have a relatively young man, 30 say, involved in a big automobile accident with fracture of long bones, comes into the hospital and a day or two later uh, develops uh, uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome and the PO2 rapidly falls down to 50, then he would be called a respiratory failure, even though his blood gases were not very different from the uh, patient that I previously mentioned. Now let's start by looking at the arterial PO2 because all patients with respiratory failure have severe hypoxemia. And let's look at uh, first the oxygen dissociation curve. I like to keep that at the back of my mind when I look at a PO2 in a, 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 a laboratory record of uh, arterial blood gases. And the important features as far as we're concerned here is that the upper part of the oxygen dissociation curve, of course, is relatively flat. So that we can actually drop the arterial PO2 from the normal value of 100 down to, say, 60, and the arterial oxygen saturation is still about 90%. So there's a remarkable ability to maintain the oxygen concentration of the blood in spite of a reduction in PO2 near the top of the curve. But once we get below 60 into the uh, 50, 40, something like that, PO2, of course the saturation rapidly falls. The other important feature we should remember is that there are three anchor points on the oxygen dissociation curve, at least I think of those three points. The first is a normal arterial PO2 of 100 with a saturation of about 97%. The next is a PO2 of about 40 in mixed venous blood which gives us, a, gives us a saturation of about 75%. And finally, the P50, that's the partial pressure of oxygen for 50% saturation in normal subjects, about 27 millimeters of mercury. So those are useful, three, three useful anchor points that allow us to uh, predict pretty much what the oxygen saturation is going to be for different levels of PO2. Now the causes of hypoxemia we've talked about uh, previously and I'm just going to go over them very briefly. There are four, hypoventilation, diffusion impairment, shunt and ventilation perfusion inequality. And in the context of respiratory failure, by far the most important cause is ventilation perfusion inequality. And incidentally in VAQ inequality we include blood flow to unventilated lung uh, in areas of atelectasis, for example, uh, which you could, if you like, call shunt. That's included in the VAQ inequality story. Sometimes people add another cause, a fifth cause, and that is a reduction in the inspired PO2. Uh, that can occur, of course, if you go to high altitude or rarely in an industrial setting where somebody finds himself in a closed space and oxygen concentration uh, is reduced. But of course, in normal clinical 
conditions at, at sea level, these are the four important causes. Now, what are the effects of hypoxemia? Well, mild hypoxemia causes very few changes. There are minor alterations in cognitive uh, function and also uh, in visual uh, acuity. Uh, for example, a pilot of a high-performance aircraft who's trying to uh, see things at night will be using oxygen because uh, the visual acuity is reduced even with quite minor degrees of hypoxemia. But those are not normally noticed by most of us. Uh, however, when the hypoxemia becomes severe, then there are a number of effects, uh, particularly on the central nervous system. Uh, for example, you can get headache, uh, sleepiness, somnolence, and clouding of consciousness. Uh, if you go further with a, uh, a, an acute severe hypoxia, then there may be convulsions and there may be permanent brain damage. In fact, we've already mentioned, I think, the example of someone who falls into a swimming pool, is pulled out, say, 10 minutes later, is revived, but the central nervous system never uh, returns to its, its normal level. Severe hypoxemia also has effects on the cardiovascular system, as shown here. There is tachycardia, uh, mild hypertension. These are probably caused by the increase in circulating catecholamines. Uh, more severe hypoxia can cause bradycardia and hypotension. If the hypoxemia is associated with a low alveolar, alveolar PO2, which it very often is, then you may get hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction with pulmonary hypertension, so the lungs are affected. The renal system, you get sodium retention and you get uh, protein, proteinuria with severe hypoxia. So those are the effects of hypoxemia. Let's now turn to CO2. Looking at a PCO2 on a, an arterial blood gas report, I think one of the things we need to have at the back of our mind are the CO2 dissociation curves. And the critical point here is that over the normal working range, which is a PCO2 of something like 40 to 50, it's quite a small range, the dissociation curve is essentially straight. So it's quite different from the oxygen dissociation curve. Another point we should bear in mind is that blood with a low arterial oxygen saturation can carry more CO2 for a given PCO2 than deoxygenated blood, than uh, fully oxygenated blood, I should say. Also notice that dissolved CO2 is more important uh, for, uh, for CO2 transport. Uh, for oxygen transport, dissolved oxygen is relatively unimportant. Now, there are two causes of CO2 retention. One, of course, is hypoventilation, which we're uh, quite familiar with. But I'd like to emphasize, of course, that the second cause is ventilation perfusion inequality. That sometimes is overlooked, but we should remember that ventilation perfusion, perfusion inequality interferes with the transfer of all gases by the lung, including carbon dioxide. So other, being, other things being equal, a patient with VAQ inequality will have an increased arterial PCO2. And the reason why we often see patients with a normal PCO2 and VAQ inequality is that that patient has increased the ventilation to his alveoli. What are the effects of CO2 retention and increased arterial PCO2? Well, an important effect is that the, there is cerebral vasodilatation and an increase in cerebral blood flow. And that has several effects. Uh, these include headache, uh, a raised uh, CSF pressure, and sometimes papilledema. Uh, looking at the fundus of the eye, you can see edema in the uh, back of the eye, and that's a, uh, an indication of the raised pressure in the cerebral spinal fluid. There may also be restlessness and tremor and slurred speech. And occasionally there's asterixis, a, a flapping tremor. Now, I don't know how often that's seen today, but I can remember seeing that a number of years ago when I was working in London. And uh, there were patients there with COPD, severe COPD, with some chronic bronchitis. And if there was a good old London fog, P-super as they were called, 
then often these patients would develop acute bronchitis because of the pollution and they would uh, develop very low levels of arterial PO2. And in those days, they would be given high concentrations of oxygen. As we'll see in a moment, that causes a, a reduction in ventilation, PCO2 rises, and those patients sometimes showed this uh, sign of aspherixis. There are also mood fluctuations that, occur, that can occur. Some patients, for example, become very aggressive uh, under these conditions. Very high concentrations of CO2 are narcotic and can definitely cloud consciousness. Now what about pH? Because that's the third variable we look at when we see the arterial blood gases in a patient with respiratory failure. And this is simply to remind us, which we should have at the back of our mind, the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation shown here, and the fact that there are four basic acid-base disturbances. Uh, you can have respiratory or metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. Now patients with respiratory failure frequently are acidotic. And one of the reasons is that there is often CO2 retention. Uh, for example, the patient with COPD, who, uh, the, in which there is an exacerbation of bronchitis, for example, and his PCO tends to rise, uh, he becomes acidotic. Although the metabolic compensation uh, from the kidney will tend to keep that in check. The kidney will retain bicarbonate, tend to return the P pH to near its normal level. But in addition, these patients often have a metabolic acidosis, and that will result from lactate being released from hypoxic, poorly perfused tissues. Uh, that's particularly likely to occur in a patient who is mechanically ventilated, because these patients often have a reduced cardiac output and venous return, particularly if uh, levels of positive end expiratory pressure are being used. And again, we'll talk about that a little later on. And if that's the case, you can get poor tissue perfusion and that uh, can be responsible for the acidosis, the metabolic acidosis in these patients. Now, an important feature in respiratory failure sometimes is diaphragmatic fatigue, fatigue of the diaphragm. And fatigue is defined as a loss of contractile force after a period of work. In other words, you do a certain amount of work and you find that you're not able to generate the same amount of force that you were previous to uh, the period of work. It turns out that the diaphragm uh, is it's not smooth muscle, it's striated skeletal muscle with both slow twitch oxidative and fast twitch uh, oxidative glycolytic fibers. Uh, normally, those fibers are relatively resistant to fatigue, but uh, fatigue can sometimes occur. It can be measured from the transdiaphragmatic pressure, if you have balloons in the esophagus and uh, below the diaphragm, and you can also get in an indication uh, indirectly from the electromyogram. The reason why diaphragmatic fatigue occurs is that the work of breathing is very high in some of these patients with COPD. Of course, they have severe airways obstruction, which means that the work of breathing is increased. Also, the mechanical advantage of the diaphragm is often poor because the diaphragm is relatively flat and contraction of it results in a relatively small increase in the vertical dimension of the, of the uh, chest cavity. So, these patients tend to develop uh, um, fatigue, diaphragm fatigue, and uh, that's an important feature. If that occurs, of course, we try to relieve that, and one way of doing that is to try to reduce the work of breathing. These patients may have some, uh, some reversible bronchospasm, bronchoconstriction, reversible bronchoconstriction, and that can be treated with bronchodilators, perhaps. Also, the infection, of course, should be treated uh, aggressively if there's an exacerbation of uh, chronic bronchitis, uh, an acute exacerbation that should be treated with uh, as, as far as possible with antibiotics. And another important thing is oxygen therapy because uh, if we can improve the PO2 in the diaphragmatic muscle, in the, the diaphragm, the muscle of the diaphragm, then we can 
improve the uh, situation as far as fatigue is concerned. Now let me move to the various types of respiratory failure. And here's a, a classification that is quite useful. Uh, you can have acute overwhelming lung disease, neuromuscular disorders, acute on chronic lung disease, adult respiratory restress syndrome, or the infant respiratory distress syndrome. And we're going to look at each of these in turn. Now it turns out that any severe lung disease, if it's severe enough and overwhelming, it can lead to respiratory failure. Uh, one example is fulminating pneumonia. Uh, if you've got an elderly person who's had some problem, perhaps a fall, and uh, he may have uh, hit his chest on something and uh, cracked a rib or two. Uh, breathing is painful to him. Uh, this, this patient may well develop pneumonia. And uh, if the pneumonia is severe enough, he can go into respiratory failure. And pneumonia in old people is a uh, relatively common cause of, uh, of death. Massive pulmonary embolism is another cause. In massive pulmonary embolism, as we described in a previous session, you get a, a big embolus in the pulmonary circulation which obstructs blood flow. There's a fall in cardiac output. There's circulatory shock. And these patients go into respiratory failure. And the, uh, the mortality rate is quite high. Another cause is inhaled toxic gases. An example is chlorine. Now, we sometimes see this in the, uh, an industrial setting where people are using chlorine, perhaps in a closed space. And there's been some talk about this recently, and I'll just mention it briefly. Uh, chlorine is transported in large tanks often uh, on, on, uh, on, uh, on railways. And sometimes these, these go through uh, areas with quite a high population. And it's been pointed out that if there was a terrorist at attack uh, on, that, on, those, on that railway and those chlorine tanks were uh, disrupted, broken, uh, then there could be a very serious problem with uh, chlorine intoxication. And, and that's something that we hope will never happen, but it's, it's uh, uh, a possibility if there is a terrorist attack. So that's acute overwhelming lung disease. Now let's move to neuromuscular disorders. And there are a whole series of these that I've listed here. But before I go through the list, let me tell you that the way I remember them is from a little cartoon like this. I think first of all of the respiratory centers where the impulses going to the respiratory muscles uh, are generated. And then uh, we can go through the, the line of uh, the the uh, line going to the muscles themselves. And so if we use a cartoon like this, we can start with the respiratory center depression. And that can be caused by drugs such as an overdose of barbiturates uh, or morphine derivatives. Uh, in addition, we can have diseases of the medulla. Uh, encephalitis can do this. Uh, hemorrhage, uh, a stroke in the uh, medulla can uh, be responsible. Going down the spinal cord a bit, we can get a, a high dislocation of the spine with damage to the spinal cord. And of course, that can affect the muscles, uh, the nerves going to the muscles of respiration. Although we should remember that uh, the diaphragm is innervated by the phrenic nerves coming from C3, 4, and 5. So the damage to the spinal cord has to be very high before it's going to affect uh, the uh, phrenic nerves. Then we go down to the anterior horn cells, poliomyelitis is an example there. Uh, bulbar polio can uh, cause uh, paralysis of the respiratory muscles. Uh, neural disease affecting the nerves going to the muscles of respiration can occur. The Guillain-Barre syndrome, for example, is uh, an example here. The myoneural junction can be affected by myasthenia gravis and also by anticholinesterase poisoning. And finally, the respiratory muscles themselves in a disease such as progressive muscular dystrophy. So those are all neuromuscular disorders that can interfere with respiration. There'll be hypoventilation, CO2 retention. Sometimes those patients, often those patients, will be treated uh, with a ventilator. Uh, 
in order to uh, bring the PCO2 back to near normal. And uh, sometimes, for example, in poliomyelitis, bulba polio, uh, patients have been on ventilators for a very long time, for months or even years. And sometimes in those cases, we use a tank type of a ventilator, rather uncommonly used now, but so sometimes used in those patients. So that's neuromuscular disorders. Now, a very important category is acute on chronic lung disease. And by that we mean an acute exacerbation of a disease in a patient with long-standing disease. And the best example, the commonest example is COPD again, where the, the disease is both emphysema and chronic bronchitis, and there is an exacerbation of the bronchitis with an acute attack. Uh, and I mentioned previously that used to happen in London with uh, the big fogs there. It doesn't happen anymore to anything like the same extent because the pollution is, uh, has been controlled to a large extent. But these patients are interesting because they're in a difficult situation. Their PCO2 uh, is increased, but if the, if the increase has been there for a while, the, the pH of the CSF, which is really responsible for the operation of the central chemoreceptors, that is brought back to near normal by an increase in bicarbonate in the CSF. So that drive to ventilation is reduced. In addition, the effect of the acidemia, the low pH on the peripheral chemoreceptors goes away because the pH of the blood is brought back to near normal by renal compensation. Uh, and so it turns out that in these patients, the hypoxemia, the effects of the low PO2 on the peripheral chemoreceptors can be a very important part of the drive to ventilation. Now, if these patients then are given a high concentration of oxygen to breathe, the uh, hypoxemia is alleviated and often the drive to ventilation is so reduced that these patients will have a low ventilation or even stop breathing altogether. And I can remember that happening that in the, uh, when I was a medical resident, we used to see patients where that was a, a relatively common problem when they came into the emergency room with severe hypoxemia and they were given high concentrations of oxygen. And then it was, and, and of course that's, a, that's a, a, a big therapeutic problem because you've got to give these patients oxygen to relieve their hypoxemia, uh, but you don't want them to go into severe CO2 retention. And it turns out that the solution there is to give relatively low concentrations of oxygen, 24%, you can start with, go up to 28 or whatever, and you monitor the arterial blood gases very carefully to see what's happening. To give these patients low co concentrations of oxygen, it's often useful to use a Venturi mask uh, because that allows you to uh, 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 deliver a relatively low and carefully controlled concentration of oxygen. So uh, that's an important group of patients and uh, in the past they were not treated well but now we understand what's happening. Now let's move to the adult or acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome, which is a very important disease in the context of respiratory failure. It's a disease which is the end result of many pathological processes and many organs are affected. So uh, a lot of physicians are regarded as multi-organ failure, not just the lung, although the lung is what is going to, in, uh, going to uh, concern us most. The pathology of the lung is that it shows uh, an edema of a very high protein concentration, a proteinaceous edema, which of course indicates that there is damage to the blood gas barrier, and therefore the filtering effect of the blood on the proteins has been, of the uh, blood gas barrier has, has been uh, destroyed. There are, there's cellular debris in the alveoli, and there are often hyaline membranes as well, having to do with the cellular debris. Uh, areas of atelectasis can be seen in the lung, uh, and sometimes these will resolve eventually, but uh, sometimes the patient is left with fibrosis. The pathogenesis is unclear, but the capillary wall damage is extensive. There's no doubt about that. Exactly why that occurs is uh, still being worked on. There are many mediators that have been implicated, bradykinin, histamine, platelet activating factor have all been considered. Uh, 
and a number of people think that oxygen radicals are important and cyclooxygenase products have also been blamed. Clinically, the condition is interesting because it often develops a couple of days or so after the initial insult. For example, as I mentioned, the, the man who, the 30-year-old man involved in a severe automobile accident comes into the hospital, his uh, long bone fractures are put in splints and he seems to be doing all right. And then a day or so later, he develops, uh, he starts to develop this, this adult respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, you see that his respiratory rate increases, his arterial PO2 falls rapidly, and if you take a radiograph, you see intense opacification often, a uh, very uh, alarming uh, radiograph. You get severe hypoxemia, of course, and the mortality is quite high. Another thing that happens is that the lung becomes very stiff. Lung compliance falls, and that means that you need unusually high pressures to ventilate it. The fall in lung compliance is associated with a reduction in functional residual capacity, and along with that you develop atelectatic areas, and of course uh, if there's blood flow through unventilated areas, that's going to contribute to the hypoxemia. The management uh, takes place in an intensive care unit, and oxygen administration is a very important feature, as is mechanical ventilation. Uh, often we need to use positive end expiratory pressures because the FRC is reduced and atelectasis is a serious problem. Uh, and uh, I'll say a bit more about PEEP as it's called a little later on. Here's an example of a radiograph in ARDS. It shows uh, a pacification in various areas as you can see. Actually sometimes the radiograph is even more uh, uh, striking than this, sometimes you get an almost complete whiteout, so a tremendous degree of uh, pathology is obvious on the radiograph. And then if you look at the lung section, it shows cellular debris in the alveoli, areas of atelectasis, uh, edema, which actually I don't see very clearly here, but often you can see edema with a high protein concentration. Uh, um, uh, you can see that in the uh, micrograph. Now, People have looked at the gas exchange abnormality in ARDS, and as you might expect, there is severe ventilation perfusion inequality. I mean, the, the architecture of the lung is, is, uh, is very, very abnormal. And here's an example uh, of a patient with ARDS, and here we're looking at the distribution of ventilation perfusion ratios. The ventilation is the open circles here, the blood flow in the closed circles here, plotted against the ventilation perfusion ratio on a log scale. We've, we've seen these uh, plots before. And you can see that the distribution is, is very abnormal. Usually all the ventilation and blood flow are closely uh, linked to a ventilation perfusion ratio of about one. But here you've got a very broad spread as you can see. In particular, quite a lot of blood flow going to lung units with very low ventilation perfusion ratios. And he, he, you notice that there's an 8% shunt. So there's a substantial amount of blood flow going through unventilated alveoli as well as going to poorly ventilated alveoli down here. Also, uh, you'll notice that there is a lot of ventilation going to lung units with very high ventilation perfusion ratios here. And this is probably, at least in part, or mostly I would say, the effects of PEEP. Uh, the positive end expiratory pressure is compressing the, uh, alve the capillaries in some of the alveoli. Because you've got to remember that in ARDS there's a tremendous uh, variation in the uh, pathology throughout the lung. And so whereas some areas can be atelectatic and you're trying to open them up with positive end expiratory pressure, other areas of the lung may be relatively normal and there of course the PEEP is going to compress the capillaries and be responsible for these regions of very high VAQ inequality. Let's move now from the adult respiratory distress syndrome to the infant respiratory distress syndrome, which in some ways is uh, a little bit similar. However, the cause is different. The chief cause is the absence of pulmonary surfactant. And you'll remember from the previous uh, sessions where we talked about surfactant, that the surfactant system uh, 
uh, develops late in fe fetal life. And so uh, babies who are born prematurely uh, may well be born before the surfactant system has completely developed. Uh, those, uh, an absence of surfactant, you remember we talked about uh, previously, has three main uh, effects. One is an absence of surfactant means that the lung becomes extremely unstable because of the high surface tensions tend to cause a closure of some of the alveoli. Uh, in addition, you, the lung becomes uh, very stiff, very difficult to expand, the compliance falls because of the absence, because of the high surface tensions. And finally, you get pulmonary edema because one of the uh, uh, effects of the increase, of s increase in surface tension of the alveolar lining layer is to reduce the pressure outside the pulmonary capillaries in the interstitium and you get pulmonary edema. So the pathology is not all that different from the adult respiratory distress syndrome in the sense that you get a hemorrhagic protonaceous edema. I mean, it's quite clear that the capillary walls are damaged, the blood gas barrier is in bad shape. Again, you get patchy atelectasis, you get uh, hyaline membranes, which have to do with, the, uh, uh, with cellular debris in the alveoli, and you, you see that as well. The PO2 is very low, there's severe hypoxemia, there's a reduced lung compliance, and mechanical ventilation is often required. Uh, there is a problem, however, with mechanical ventilation in these infants, and that is that if they're on mechanical ventilation for uh, a prolonged period, they may go on later to develop bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And this is characterized by disrupted alveolar and vascular growth and some fibrosis in the lung. That occurs uh, after a year or two of life and um, is a very... Uh, it's a, a, an unpleasant outcome, but of course sometimes these patients do have to be ventilated in order to keep them alive. Now fortunately, it's now possible to administer exogenous surfactant into the lung via the trachea. It's just dribbled into the trachea and it's always been a bit of a... Uh, I've always been amazed that it's so effective. You would think by putting something into the trachea where you've got such an enormous amount of pathology in the alveolar tissue of the lung, you would have thought it wouldn't do much good, but presumably partly because of surface tension characteristics, it manages to, uh, get to uh, permeate throughout the lung and uh, these patients are improved. And of course, if they can be maintained until the, uh, the surfactant system matures, uh, then uh, they're in better shape. Uh, here's a typical uh, uh, section of a of lung in a patient with the infant respiratory distress syndrome. You can see the areas of atelectasis here, the cellular debris. You, now you can see in this particular one the protonaceous edema here, uh, highly stained edema here. So this lung is in very bad shape and it's not surprising that there is severe hypoxemia. Now patients who uh, develop um, respiratory failure are often treated with oxygen therapy and mechanical ventilation. And I'm going to uh, go into each of these now briefly. Uh, they're both extremely important. Uh, mechanical ventilation is a, a very technical area and we're not going to spend a great deal of time on that because if you're going to find yourself in a, in, in a situation where you need to be uh, helping with mechanical ventilation, then you're going to have to learn much more about it than I can say here. But uh, let's say a word or two uh, now about oxygen therapy. And the first point I'd like to make is that oxygen therapy is an extremely powerful uh, drug, if you like, a very powerful medication. Because you see, the inspired PO2, breathing air, is only about 150. But we can raise the inspired PO2 if we give somebody a high concentration of oxygen in the intensive care unit, for example, where they're intubated, we can give them an inspired PO2 of well over 600. So it's an enormous increase in the inspired uh, amount of oxygen, and it's a very, very powerful uh, medication indeed, and some people don't appreciate that. And here what we've got is the effect of giving 100% uh, inspired oxygen on the arterial PO2. Now we don't always use 100%, in fact we rarely do, uh, but this is to show how effective it can be. 
Uh, so here we've got the arterial PO2 on this axis and breathing air, the arterial PO2 is around about uh, 90 to 100, something like that, the normal value. Now what happens if a patient has hypoventilation and you give them a high inspired oxygen concentration? Well, the arterial PO2 can rise to an extremely high value. And why is that? Well, it's easy to see if we just look at the alveolar gas equation, which we've talked about many times before. You can see that with the alveolar gas equation, here's the alveolar PO2 here, the inspired PO2, the alveolar PCO2, and the respiratory exchange ratio here, and F, a small a factor we're going to ignore. You can see that uh, the alveolar PO2 is going to track along with the inspired PO2. For example, if you raise the inspired PO2 by 100 and the PCO2 and the R remain constant, then the alveolar PO2 will increase by the same extent. So increasing the inspired oxygen concentration in hypoventilation is very effective in increasing the alveolar PO2 and therefore the arterial value. Now what about diffusion impairment? It's the second cause of hypoxemia. Well, with diffusion impairment, uh, there is certainly a, a slowed oxygen movement across the thickened blood gas barrier, for example, in diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. But if you give a high concentration of oxygen, you can easily overcome that barrier. And so typically in diffusion impairment, you can raise the arterial PO2 to very high values by giving, uh, giving a high concentration of oxygen. What about ventilation perfusion inequality? Well now here, if you give oxygen over a long enough period of time, again you can expect the arterial PO2 to rise to a very high value. Because what you do is you wash out the nitrogen in all the alveoli, and therefore the PO2 in all the alveoli uh, is, is very high, probably of the order of 600 millimeters of mercury or something like that. However, there are two caveats about that. One is that in a patient with severe inequality of ventilation, it might take some time to wash all the nitrogen out. So uh, it may take a while for the PO2 to rise to its final value. And the other caveat is, as we'll see in a few minutes, sometimes if you give a high concentration of oxygen, you can cause some alveoli to collapse and you can develop atelectasis in some regions of the lung. So that's, that's a caveat. But in general, giving high concentrations, to to high concentrations of oxygen to patients with ventilation perfusion inequality is very effective. The only cause of hypoxemia where giving inspired oxygen is, if you like, disappointing, is in shunt. Because there, of course, the shunted blood is not exposed to the inspired oxygen. The whole point about a shunt is that you've got blood being added to the arterial system, which has not been through ventilated regions of lung. And so uh, that blood, of course, is not going to be seeing the inspired oxygen. Nevertheless, it's important to realize that you can get useful gains in the arterial PO2 in the presence of a shunt. And this is shown here. Now these are theoretical data, these have just been calculated, but nevertheless actual patients behave in roughly the same way. And you can see the arterial PO2 is plotted against the inspired oxygen concentration for different percentages of shunt. This is the percent of the cardiac output which is not going through ventilated regions of lung. And you can see that even with a fairly substantial shunt, say 20% shunt here, you can see if you give 60% oxygen, you can raise the arterial PO2 uh, quite a bit. So, so it, it's a mistake to, to argue, as sometimes is done, that giving oxygen to a patient with a shunt is of no value. It can raise the arterial PO2 to, to a significant extent. And of course, the reason it does that is not that the, the inspired oxygen uh, increase is being seen by the shunted blood, but the oxygen concentration of the other blood, of the non-shunted blood, is increased because uh, a small increase in oxygen saturation, but the, the dissolved oxygen can be quite substantial if we go up to, say, 60, 80 percent of oxygen. So there is value in giving uh, a high inspired oxygen concentration to patients with a shunt.
Now we've been talking about the arterial PO2, but we shouldn't uh, forget that there are other factors in tissue hypoxia. Of course, arterial PO2 is one of the most important, but don't forget hemoglobin concentration, because if we have a patient with severe anemia, for example, where the uh, hemoglobin concentration is low, uh, then for a given arterial PO2, the uh, oxygen concentration of the blood is going to be low and therefore there can be uh, tissue hypoxia. Cardiac output is another important factor. If you have a low cardiac output, you're just not going to deliver the amount of oxygen perhaps that the tissue needs. So cardiac output is important and particularly local blood flow is important. Even if the cardiac output is normal, but the local blood flow is reduced for some reason, uh, some local obstruction, whatever, then uh, of course tissue hypoxia can ensue. And finally, the oxygen affinity of the hemoglobin uh, needs to be considered. Uh, for example, in, in carbon monoxide poisoning, where of course the main problem is that the carbon monoxide is tying up a lot of the hemoglobin and that, that hemoglobin is not available for oxygen transport, but in addition, the, the carbon monoxide causes a leftward shift in the oxygen dissociation curve. In other words, a higher oxygen affinity for the hemoglobin, uh, the hemoglobin that's left for the oxygen, and therefore it's more difficult for the oxygen to unload in the peripheral tissues, and that's another factor we should bear in mind. Now, oxygen therapy is extremely important and uh, is used, I would say, in every patient essentially in the intensive care unit, but there are problems with it, there are hazards, and we should uh, look at these briefly now. First of all, we've already mentioned the problem of CO2 retention that particularly can occur in a patient who has long-standing lung disease, perhaps COPD, and gets an acute exacerbation of bronchitis. Those patients uh, can, uh, often those patients, uh, a lot of their respiratory drive comes from their hypoxemia. If they're given a high concentration of oxygen, their ventilation is reduced and they develop CO2 retention. Another hazard is oxygen toxicity. Now we often uh, think, we often believe that the more oxygen we can get into a patient, the better. But it turns out that some tissues are, are sensitive to oxygen and one of those apparently is the endothelium of pulmonary capillaries. At any event, if you give a high concentration of oxygen for too long a period, you can damage the lung. Uh, now, the only place you're likely to see this is in the intensive care unit because that's the only place where a patient is intubated and you can give a really high concentration of oxygen. Uh, and uh, there are various rules of thumb. Some people say you shouldn't give more than 50% oxygen for more than 48 hours. I mean, it, every case has to be looked at individually but uh, people uh, have to be aware of the possibility of oxygen toxicity. And you can see that this can be a very difficult situation because some of these patients have very severe hypoxemia. You're very anxious to move the PO2 into a, a, a range, say, between 50 and 60, something like that. But on the, on the other hand, you want to be very careful that you don't cause ox oxygen toxicity in the process. Lung atelectasis is another hazard of oxygen therapy, and let me show you an example here. Now this is the distribution we saw before of the, the, the AQ distribution in a patient with ARDS. And you remember that there was blood flow, as you can see here, to lung units with low ventilation perfusion ratios, and in this case an 8% shunt. Now this patient was given a, uh, oxygen, a high oxygen concentration to breathe, and look what happened. Now we're only showing the blood flows. Here's the blood flow here, and the closed circles are the ones we saw in the last slide. The open circles are what happened after the oxygen breathing. And you can see a very interesting change. What happened was that the blood flow to the poorly ventilated alveoli disappeared. The low VAQ units disappeared, but at the same time, the shunt increased from eight to nearly 16%. So the most likely explanation there is that the low VAQ units were converted into unventilated units. And the mechanism of that is shown here. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but just to show you that if you have lung units 
with a very low ventilation perfusion ratio. Now we're showing here the inspired ventilation uh, over the perfusion here and it's quite a low ratio as you can see uh, and under those conditions what happens is that although the inspired ventilation is quite substantial uh, most of the gas is taken away by the alveoli. Remember these, this is uh, inspiring 80% oxygen so there's quite a high alveolar PO2, reasonably high alveolar PO2. So the expired ventilation is very small. In fact, if you reduce the ventilation perfusion ratio a little bit more, none of the gas is exhaled. And in fact, if you go to an even lower ventilation perfusion ratio, gas has to come into the unit during the expiratory phase. And so those patients, those uh, alveoli are un unstable and tend to collapse. So there is a mechanism whereby units with very low ventilation perfusion ratios will collapse, will become, uh, uh, ventilation will, will be abolished if they are, uh, are given a high oxygen concentration to breathe. The final hazard I'll just mention very briefly is retrolental fibroplasia. Uh, this occurs in infants who are treated with the uh, um, infant respiratory distress syndrome, uh, typically. And if the, uh, if the arterial PO2 is sufficiently high, they can develop a fibrosis behind the lens in the eye. But this, this is well recognized now and people are very careful uh, to keep the arterial PO2 below uh, a level that would cause that to happen. Finally, let's say a few words about mechanical ventilation. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is a very technical area and I don't want, and it would be foolish to try and go into too much detail, but let's uh, review it very briefly. First of all, in order to mechanically ventilate a patient, you've got to intubate him. You've got to get a, a, some way of uh, introducing the gas into the, the trachea. And usually this is done by an endotracheal tube, which is put in via the mouth or the nose, uh, or sometimes by a tracheostomy uh, in the anterior uh, of the, the trachea is opened up and a tracheostomy tube is inserted. And there is a cuff on the end of the tube, which uh, makes, the, uh, makes it an airtight seal. And incidentally, there was a problem with these cuffs in the past, sometimes they were very stiff and they damaged the wall of the trachea and sometimes you've got scarring uh, following that uh, but now people recognize that problem there are there are low pressure cuffs which are still airtight and uh, so we don't have that particular problem. Now there are two types of ventilators that I'm going to be talking about the constant volume and the constant pressure ventilators and here's a diagram of a constant volume ventilator here as the piston is moved up and down, as it moves down, the oxygen or the air, oxygen, oxygenated air is brought in, and then as the piston moves up, it, the, that valve closes and the, uh, the, uh, the gas is transmitted to the patient. And during the inspiratory phase, you've got a device here which allows expiration to go to a spirometer uh, if, if necessary. So these uh, are, tend to be rather large machines. They're used in the operating uh, room all the time by the anesthesiologist. Uh, they're expensive and they're very robust. Uh, they're, they're, they're big devices. Uh, they're, they're, they're used extensively in the intensive care uh, uh, um, environment and they're very reliable machines. The constant pressure ventilators are quite different. Uh, that's a ventilator that's attached to a source of gas at high pressure and uh, it is sometimes triggered by the patient taking a breath. Since it uh, uh, develops a constant pressure, the volume given to the patient depends to some extent on the compliance of the lung. And if the compliance of the lung changes, the ventilation may change. So these are uh, perhaps a little more difficult to uh, control. They're not as uh, reliable in that sense. They're, they're smaller, they're cheaper, they're e relatively easy to use, um, but, uh, and they are, they're quite effective. Let's look at the patterns of ventilation. Well, the most, the, the most frequent pattern is what's called intermittent positive pressure ventilation, IPPV, where you simply, as I showed, 
on the slide with the uh, with the constant volume, the piston comes up and puts a certain volume of gas into the patient, and then the patient uh, just exhales. That's a um, uh, a very common method, and that's used, for example, during anesthesia. That's the one that's often used. But important uh, pattern of ventilation is what's called positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP, and uh, we need to say a few words about that. Let me show you some measurements that were made of the gas exchange using this plot of ventilation perfusion inequality uh, in a patient with uh, ARDS, the Adult Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And you can see here that on the top left we've got the situation with no PEEP. Okay, and the distribution looks moderately normal, a uh, bit of blood flow to unventilated lung, but look, the shunt was 43.8%, so enormous shunt, enormous amount of blood flow of cardiac output going to unventilated alveoli. And so that patient was put on 5 centimeters of PEEP here, top right, and the shunt decreased from 44% to 36%. But you'll notice that the dead space increased, went from 36% to 40.6% here. So we saw this before. When you add PEEP, you often increase dead space. Actually, uh, in this case, it didn't increase the, the uh, uh, ventilation to poorly perfused alveoli, these, these, but the uh, dead space was increased partly possibly because a slight increase in anatomic dead space, but also there will be an increase in the number of of lung units which are completely unperfused. When the PEEP was increased, as shown here, bottom left, to 12 centimeters of water, the shunt decreased further to now about 26%. Over here, dead space increased a bit more, and with 16 centimeters of water, shunt was down to 14%. So you can see the enormous advantage here in, uh, in uh, PEEP. You can, uh, you can certainly decrease a shunt and increase the arterial PO2 very effectively with PEEP, and that's why it's very extensively used. So here are some of the effects of PEEP. It increases the FRC, uh, as you would expect, because the, the airway pressure at the end of expiration uh, is uh, increased. And perhaps I should have just clarified, in case people are not familiar with this, the Positive end expiratory pressure means that the pressure in the airway at the end of expiration uh, is what the peak pressure is, and that's obtained by putting the expiration tube under water, something like that, various ways of, of doing that. So that in increases the FRC. That in turn reduces the amount of atelectasis, uh, and that tends to raise the uh, PO2. However, there can be compression of the capillaries, increasing dead space, you can also reduce venous return because when you increase the pressure within the thorax, which is what you're doing, you're tending to impede venous return to the thorax. And finally, uh, something that's been emphasized relatively recently is that large pressures, large uh, amounts of PEEP with the associated high lung volumes can damage the pulmonary capillaries. And we actually mentioned that earlier on um, the pulmonary, the wall of the capillary is exposed to a stress uh, because of the pressure within the capillary uh, and the Laplace law, you get an increase in pressure, increase in stress in the wall of the capillary. But if you then increase the tension in the alveoli, which you do at high lung volumes, you'll also increase the stress in the uh, capillaries and that tends to damage them. So that's uh, positive end expiratory pressure. Another uh, some, uh, uh, mode of ventilation that's sometimes used is continuous positive airway pressure. And that's particularly important in the uh, treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, in in uh, sleep apnea, you, you get uh, obstruction to the upper airway and these patients sleep badly and that has important effects sometimes on them uh, the following day, they're asleep, they're, they're, they lack sleep, and they can be treated by using a mask with continuous positive airway pressure. And that's an important advance, and a lot of patients now, a lot of patients have obstructive sleep apnea, a very common condition, and some of them do extremely well if they put on, a, use a mask with continuous positive airway pressure.
And finally, there's a rather exotic form of ventilation called high frequency ventilation, where the patient is given, uh, is not ventilated per se, but, but the, the air is vibrated, as it were. It's something like 20 cycles per second, very, very fast ventilation. And uh, the tidal volumes are small, but the high rate of ventilation is very effective. And that is, is not extensively used, but that's sometimes used, for example, with a bronchopulmonary fistula. If there's a, uh, a leak in the, uh, in the pleural surface, uh, then you don't want to use uh, these other methods of ventilation because you're going to give a big uh, a, 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 a pneumothorax, but uh, high frequency ventilation can be used there. So this is the uh, final uh, session uh, in this series on uh, pulmonary pathophysiology. It's been a pleasure talking to you and maybe see you again sometime. Bye for now.